Chapter Eight of the Bells of San Juan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Bells of San Juan by Jackson Gregory. Chapter Eight. Jim Galloway's Game. As full consciousness of her surroundings returned slowly to her, Virginia Page at first thought that she had been awakened by the aroma of boiling coffee. Then, sitting up, wide awake, she knew that Norton had come to the doorway of her separate chamber and had called. She threw off her blankets and got up hastily. It was still dark. She imagined that she had merely dozed and that Norton was summoning her because Rocky Lane was worse. A dim glow shone through the cave entrance, that flickering, uncertain light eloquent of a campfire. As her hands went swiftly and femininely to her hair, she heard Norton's voice in a laughing remark. Only then she knew that she had slept three or four hours, that the dawn was near, that it was time for her to return to San Juan. "'Good morning,' she said brightly. Norton, squatting by the fire, frying pan in hand, turned and answered her nod. Rocky Lane, flat on his back, with his hands clasped behind his head, his cigarette in his mouth, twisted a little where he lay, his eyes eager upon his doctor. Virginia came on into the full light, striking the pine needles from her riding habit. "'Time to eat and ride,' said Norton, turning again to his task. "'Bacon and coffee and exercise. Have you rested?' "'Perfectly. And Mr. Lane?' "'Me?' Eh? said Rocky. Feeling fine. Norton gave her a cup of warm water to wash her hands. Then she made a second, very careful examination of Rocky's wound, cleansing it and adjusting a fresh bandage. I want to start in half an hour, said the sheriff. There'll be light enough then so that we can take time getting down to the horses and yet not enough light to show us up to a chance early rider down below. Then we'll swing off to the west, make a wide bend, ride through Los Estrellas, and get back into San Juan when we please. That is, you will. I'll leave you outside at Los Estrellas, showing you the way. And while you eat, I'm going to tell you something. About Galloway? she asked quickly. Explaining what you meant by Galloway's hangout? Yes, more than that. For a little she stood, looking at him very gravely. Then she spoke in utter frankness. Mr. Norton, I think I can see your position. You were so circumstanced through Mr. Lane's being hurt that you had to bring either Dr. Patton or me here. You decided it would be wiser to bring me. There is something of a compliment in that, isn't there? Well, you don't know Caleb Patton yet, growled Brocky a bit savagely. Already it seems to me, she went on, that you have a pretty hard row to hoe. It is evident that you have discovered a sort of thieves' headquarters here, that for your own reasons, you don't want it known that you found it. To say that I am not curious about it all would be talking nonsense, of course, and yet I can assure you that I hold you under no obligation whatever to do any explaining. You're the sheriff, and your job is to get results, not be polite to the ladies. But Norton shook his head. You know what you know, he said seriously. I think that if you know a little more, you will more readily understand why we must insist on keeping our mouths shut. All of us. In that case, returned the girl, and before you boil that coffee into any more hopelessly black a concoction that it already is, I'm ready to drink mine and listen. Coffee, Mr. Lane? Never mind, thanks, answered Brocky. Spin the yarn, Rod. Norton put down his frying pan, the bacon brown and crisp, and rose to his feet. You will come this way a moment, Miss Page, he asked. To begin with, seeing is believing. She followed him, as she had last night, back into the cave in which she had slept. But Norton did not stop here. He went on. Virginia, still following him, came to that other hole in the rock wall, which she had noted by the lantern light. In here, he said. Just look. He swept a match across his thigh, holding it up for her. She came to his side and looked in. First she saw a number of small boxes, innocent-appearing affairs, with suggested soda-crackers. Beyond them was something covered with a blanket. Norton stepped by her and jerked the covering aside. Startled, puzzled by what she saw, she looked at him wonderingly, placed neatly, lying side by side, their metal surfaces winking back at the light of Norton's match were a number of rifles, a score of them, fifty perhaps. "'Looks like a young revolution.' he cried, her gaze held, her eyes fascinated by the unexpected. "'You've seen about everything now,' he told her. 
the red ember of a burnt-out match dropping to the floor. Those boxes contain cartridges. Now let's go back to Brocky. But they'll see that you've been here. I'll come back in a minute with the lantern. I want a further chance to look things over. Then I'll put the blanket back and see that not even that charred match gives us away. And we'd better be eating and getting started. With a steaming tin of black coffee before her, a brown piece of bacon between her fingers, she forgot to eat or drink while she listened to Norton's story. At the beginning it seemed incredible. Then, her thoughts sweeping back over the experiences of those last twenty-four hours, her eyes having before them the picture of a sheriff grim-faced and determined, a wounded man lying just beyond the fire, the rough, rudely arched walls and ceiling of a cave man's dwelling about her, she deemed that what Norton knew and suspected was but the thing to be expected. "'Jim Galloway's a big man,' Sheriff said thoughtfully. "'Very big man in his way. My father was after him for a long time. I have been after him ever since my father's death. But it is only recently that I have come to appreciate Jim Galloway's caliber. That's why I could never get him with the goods on. I've been looking for him in the wrong places.' I estimated that he was making money with the Casa Blanca and a similar house which he operates in Pozo. I thought that his entire game lay in such layouts and a bit of business now and then like the robbing of the Los Palmas man. But now I know that most of these lesser jobs are not even Galloway's affair. That he let some of his crowd like the Kid or Antone or Morega put them across and keep the spoils. Often enough in a word, while I've been looking for Jim Galloway in the brush, he's been doing his stunt in the big timber. Now, the look in Norton's eyes suggested that he had forgotten the girl to whom he was talking. And now I've picked up his trail. And that's something, interposed Brocky Lane, a flash of fire in his own eyes, considering that no man has ever known better than Jim Galloway how to cover tracks. You see, continued Norton, Jim Galloway's bigness consists very largely of these two things. He knows how to keep his hands off the little jobs, and he knows how to hold men to him. Brisby of Los Palmos goes down in Casablanca. His money, perhaps a thousand dollars, finds its way into the pockets of Kid Rickard, Antone, and maybe two or three other men. Jim Galloway sees what goes on and does no petty haggling over the spoils. He gets a strangled hole on men who do the job that cost him nothing but another lie or so, and he has them where he can count on them later on when he needs such men. Further, if they are arrested, Jim Galloway and Galloway's money come to the front. They are defended in court by the best lawyers to be had, men are bribed, and they go free. As a result of such labors on Galloway's part, I'd say, at a rough guess, that there are from a dozen to fifty men in the county right now who are his men, body and soul. With a gang like that at his back, a man of Galloway's type has grown pretty strong, strong enough to plan, yes, and by the Lord carry out. The kind of game he's playing right now. A half-breed took sick and died a short time ago, a man whom I'd never set eyes on particularly, it happened that he was a superstitious devil and that he was a second or third cousin of Ignacio Chavez. He was quite positive that unless the bells rang properly for him, he would go to hell the shortest way. So he sent for Ignacio and wound up by talking a good deal. Ignacio passed the word on to me, and that was the first inkling I had of Galloway's real game. In a word, this is what it is. He plans on one big stroke, and then a long rest and quiet enjoyment of the proceeds. You have seen the rifles. He'll arm a crowd of his best men, or his worst as you please, swoop down on San Juan, rob the bank, shooting down just as many men as happen to be in the way, rush in automobiles to Pozo and Keppelstown, stick up the bank there, levy on the Los Palmos mines, and then steer straight to the border. And if all worked according to schedule, the papers across the country would record the most daring raid across the border yet, blaming the whole fair on a detachment of gringo-hating Mexican bandits and revolutionists. Virginia stared at him half incredulously, but
but the look in Norton's eyes, the same look in Brocky Lane's, assured her. "'Why did you wait, then?' she asked sharply. "'If you know all this, why don't you arrest the man and his accomplices now, before it is too late?' "'And have the whole country laugh at me? Where's my evidence?' Just the word of a dead Indian, repeated by another Indian, and a few rifles hid in the mountains, even if we proved the rifles were Galloway's, and I don't believe we could, how would we set about proving his intention? No, I've talked it all over with the district attorney, and we can't move yet. We've got our chance at last, the chance to watch and get Jim Galloway with the goods on. But we've got to wait until he is just ready to strike, and then... We're going to put a stop to lawlessness in San Juan once and for all. But, she objected breathlessly, if he should strike before you're ready? It is our one business in life that he doesn't do it. We know what he's up to. We've found his hiding place. We shall keep an eye on it night and day. He doesn't know that we have been here. No one knows but ourselves. You see now, Miss Page, why I couldn't bring Patton here? Patton talks too much, and Galloway knows every thought in Patton's mind. And you understand how important it is for you to forget that you've ever been here. She sat silent, staring into the embers of the dying fire. thing which I can't understand, she said presently, is that if Jim Galloway is the big man that you say he is, he should do as much talking as he must have done that he should have told his plans to such a man as the Indian who told them to Ignacio Chavez. But he didn't tell all of this, Norton informed her. The Indian died without guessing what I've told you. He merely knew that the rifles were here because Galloway had employed him to bring them and because he was the man who told Galloway of his hiding place. He believed that Galloway's whole scheme was to smuggle a lot of arms and ammunition south and across the border, selling to the Mexicans. But from what little he could tell, Chavez, and from what we found out ourselves, the whole play becomes pretty obvious. No, Galloway hasn't been talking. He has been playing as safe as a man can upon such business as this. His luck was against him, that's all, when the Indian died and insisted on being rung out by the San Juan Bells. There's always that little element of chance in any business, legitimate or otherwise. And now... You'll finish your breakfast. I'll show you a view you'll never forget. And then we'll hit the trail. But, Mr. Lane, she asked, you don't intend to leave him here all alone. He will get well with the proper attention, but he must have that. Within an hour or so, Norton told her, Tom Cutter will be back with one of Brocky's cowboys. They'll move Lane into a canyon on the other side of the mountain. Oh, I know he oughtn't to be moved, but what else can we do? Besides, Brocky insists on it. Then they'll arrange to take care of him. If necessary, if you'll come out again tomorrow night. Of course, she said. She went to Brocky and held out her hand to him. I understand now, I think, why you would refuse to die, no matter how badly you were hurt, unless you had helped Mr. Norton finish the work you have set your hands to. It's an honor, Mr. Lane, to have a patient like you. Whereupon Brocky Lane grew promptly crimson and tongue-tied. And now the view, Mr. Norton, and I am ready to go. He led her way to the outer edge from which last night they had entered the cave. In daylight, you can see half round the world from here, he said as they stood with their backs to the rock. Now you can get an idea of what it's like. Below her was the chasm formed by the cliff, standing sheer and fronting other tall cliffs, looming blackly, the stars beginning to fade in the sky above them. Norton pushed a stone outward with his boot. She heard it strike, rebound, strike again, and then there was silence. When the falling stone reached the bottom, no sound came back to tell her how far it had dropped. Turning a little to look southward, she saw the cliff standing further and further back on each side, so that the eye might travel between them and out over the lower slopes and the distant stretches of level land, which, more now than ever, seemed a great limitless sea. The stars were paling rapidly. The first glint of the new day was in the air. The world lay shadowy and silent and lifeless, softened in the seeming, but as in the daytime, slumberous under an atmosphere of brooding mystery. When you told me last night, when you put your rope around me and said I might fall a half dozen feet? 
Had we fallen, it would have been a hundred feet, many a time, he said quietly. But I knew we wouldn't fall, and, looking into her face with an expression in his eyes which the shadows hid, I shouldn't have sought to minimize the danger to you had I known you as well as I think I know you now. Thank you, she said lightly. But she was conscious of a warm, pleasurable glow throughout her entire being. It was good to live life in the open. It was good to stand upon the cliff-tops with a man like Roderick Norton. It was good to have such a man speak thus. Five minutes later they were making their way down the cliffs towards their horses. End of chapter 8